For a fire to take place, there are three components required. There's fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source. Fire is prevented or extinguished if any one of the above three components is removed. There are major, two major types of fire, depending on the fuel source. There's a hydrocarbon fire. This is fueled by flammable liquids, solvents, gases, and a hydrocarbon nature, i.e. contained and hydro hydrogen only. And then there's the cellulosic fire, which is flam fueled by flammable materials such as wood, textiles, furniture, paper, etc., which we find in commercial buildings. However, due to shortage of time in, for this, the presentation, we will only discuss cellulosic fire. <coughs> cellulosic fires do not have temperature rise as rapid as hydrocarbon ones. Cellulosic-based fuels give slower temperature rise. This does not make them less devastating. The temperature over 500 C can be reached in less than 10 minutes. Five minutes, rather. Time temperature curve to show temperature rise during a cellulosic fire. You can see it reaches almost 700 degrees C within less than 10 minutes. In a full fire, in a full fire, that is. <coughs> Most commonly used building materials lose strength when exposed to fire. Concrete will spall to expose its reinforcements. Wood and timber depletes by charring. Steel buckles and starts to lose structural strength at around the 300 degrees centigrade, regardless of the type of material used. To protect safety of people's tenants, tenants to protect properties and assets, and to meet with the building and insurance requirements. <coughs> there are two major types of fire protection in the construction industry. Active fire protection systems designed to attack and put out the source like sprinklers, deluge systems, halogen gas, water mist, foam systems, etc. These are active. Some type of uh, the illustrations of the types of active systems. And then there are passive systems, which we do, which are designed to provide insulation to the actual structure, the structural steel. Uh, materials used are like fiber boards, calcium silicate boards, spray fibers, cement, lightweight cementitious composites, plastics and phenolics, epoxy-based intumescents, usually thick film and two-pack, which are more normally used at hydrocarbon uh, fires. And then there's the thin film intumescents, solvent and water-based, which is again used in commercial buildings. Now, active systems versus passive systems. Oh, some uh, consultants think that if we have an active system, we don't need any protection to the steel. Uh, active systems, fire protections like sprinklers, are vulnerable to interruption. If you get an electricity outage or if there's less water in the, uh, in the storage tanks, either accidental or sometimes even deliberate ineffective pumping or blockage of the deluge nozzles. In India, we don't maintain our fire safety. So sometimes when they have a fire, the sprinklers are already cocked. They're filled with, uh, with dirt, so they don't work. They don't do the job for which they were designed. Regular maintenance to ensure they remain effective, which in India, as you know, is a big hyperbole. Whereas passive system, is a proven system. It's readily in place uh, if it's correctly installed, minimum maintenance required after application, and can provide additional functions such as corrosion protection, which are usually in the case of intumescent paints. <coughs> now, the types of con uh, fireproofing materials. One is concrete. It is non-homogeneous. Its fire performance is controlled by that of the aggregate and the cement paste. Conveniently grouped as normal weight concrete and lightweight concrete. Recently, only high strength concrete has been used widely as high performance construction materials due to its superior strength. Compressive strength at least 50 MPa, stiffness and durability. It possesses low thermal conductivity, 50 times lower than steel. Provides good inherent fire resistance of concrete structures. But the main concern is its high susceptibility to explosive spalling during a fire. When the fire brigade uh, applies the hoses, 
you get extreme spalling and uh, vulnerability to the fire people out of uh, damage. Wood and timber, not very much used in construction, but classified as combustible material, but properly designed timber structures can perform well in a fire. Light timber structure is normally protected from fire by fire-resistant cladding materials. Heavy timber construction has good inherent fire resistance because a char layer is formed that retards the heat penetration. Temperatures of the fire exposed surface of a heavy timber member is close to the fire temperature. When the outer wood layer reaches its burning point of around 300 Celsius, the wood ignites and burns rapidly. The burned wood becomes a layer of char, which loses all strength but retains an insulation layer preventing excessive temperature rise in the core. Hot finished carbon steel begins to lose strength at temperatures above 300 C and reduces its strength at steady rate up to 800 C. The small resi residual grade then reduces more gradually until the melting point of around 1500 C. This behavior is similar for hot roll reinforced steel. Coal work steel lose strength more rapidly after 300 C. In addition to the reduction of material strength and stiffness, steel displays a significant creep phenomena at temperatures above 450 degrees C. The phenomena of creep results in an increase in deformation, which is strain with time, even if the temperature and applied stress remains unchanged. <coughs> High temperature creep is dependent on the stress level and heating rate. Occurrence of creep indicates that the stress and temperature his history have to be taken into account in estimating the strength and deform deformation behavior of steel in fire. For simple design methods, it is widely accepted that the effect of creep is implicitly considered in the stress-strain temperature relationship. Thermal properties of steel at elevated temperatures are found to be dependent on temperature and are less influenced by the stress level and heating rate. <coughs> Typographical example of how steel starts losing its strength at around the 550 degrees Celsius, which is, if you take it in minutes, it's probably 10 minutes. <coughs> Structural steel integrity, as discussed before, fully stressed hot finished carbon steel loses its design safety margin when it approaches 5550C. Steel temperature rise is fairly rapid when exposed to cellulosic fires. Here is a graph showing the cellulosic fire and then the steel temperature rise, the heating range. And as you can see, around the eight minute mark, the steel has reached its failure temperature of around 550 degrees. So we've got about a 10 minute margin before steel starts failing in a fire. <coughs> Without any protection, steel structures can only retain its structural ability for less than 10 minutes in a cellulosic fire. Less than 10 minutes is not enough for tenants to evacuate. Lives and assets are in serious risks. Could become a disaster. Okay, the types of fireproofing that are generally used conventionally First type is a rigid board of vermiculite or calcium silicate. Suitable for all areas and all types of structures. They give protection up to four hours, depending the thicknesses of the, of the slab increases, of course. But you can get four hours, the fire-rated uh, BS tests. Installations is time-consuming and not cost-effective due to the excessive material wastage in cutting standard size board. The wastage of material is like 50%. So that may, uh, the, the knock-on cost of the system becomes not cost-effective. But it is recommended wherever aesthetics and durability is a criteria. <coughs> Passive fire protection system, cementitious spray. Very popular now in India. Cementitious spray types. We have a gypsum base, which is a lightweight in place density of 240 kgs per cubic meter. This is for internal concealed steel, which is concealed from view. You don't see it. It's behind the false ceilings and the panels. 
Then we've got a Portland cement base, which is medium in place density of 350 kgs. These are for internal areas concealed and semi-exposed areas concealed. Can we post exposed areas internal for high humidity, like car parks, wet areas, kitchens, etc. Third category is a Portland cement based high in place density, 640 kilograms of cube meter, for internal and external areas where high bond strength, compressive strength is required to withstand impact, mechanical abuse, suitable for external weather, freeze, thaw, wind, and rain. Anti corrosive primer on steel is optional and as per the project requirements. In C1 classified environments, that is internal air conditioned, primer is sometimes not necessary. <coughs> I think. Oh, sorry. Well, this is supposed to be a video. Uh, press on it. It will play like this. One before that. Sorry, oh, from there? Yeah, okay. So this is the actual application of a cementitious spray. The reason I've given, I've put this video on is to tell most people that, as you can see, the flutes between the upper beam and the corrugated sheet has to be filled prior to the f uh, coating of this. It's very important as per the codes, the codal requirements of uh, UL and the fire test. So anything with two hours and more, has to have the flutes filled. And the rest of it is just a standard coating. It's sprayed on to the thickness required. It's all manual and manually checked with the gauge. Yeah. The next is the intermission coatings. <coughs> Internal Met railway stations. This is our great BKC Honda showroom. Five years ago done in intermission paint and externally uh, sea facing. <coughs> International airports, many airports done in intermission paint. The word derives from a French verb intumes, which means to swell or grow. An intermess material is a product that will swell or expand in size when exposed to heat of a certain temperature. Intermessent coatings will do exactly the same and produce a char-like material that insulates the steelwork and prevents collapse for a certain period of time. A coating which reacts by, to heat by swelling in a controlled manner to many times its original thickness to provide a carbonaceous char which acts as an insulating layer to protect the steel stru structure. Slows down the heat transfer process from a fire to the steel surface by first swelling, then forming a char, which has insulating properties. I think we have to do that. This is just a demonstration of the intumescent reacting in a fire. See the amount of it expands. It expands about 60 to 70 times its original thickness. Okay, the times of intumescent coatings we have is water-based coatings having a low volatile organic content, meeting the LEEDS ratings for green buildings. Suitable for inter inter interior exposed areas where an aesthetic architectural finish is required. We have a solvent based coating having a reasonably high VOC. Recommended for external areas where weather conditions of sun, freeze, thaw, wind and rain are uh, prevalent. Then there's a two part epoxy solvent based coating suitable for industrial plants, offshore platforms, for hydrocarbon fire protection in external environments aggressive weather conditions. All coatings must be applied over grid blasted steel with a minimum of 60 microns dry film thickness, zinc phosphate two-part epoxy primer. 
for aesthetic and durability reasons, a polyurethane top seal of any RAL color should be applied over the cured intumescent coating. Steel to be blasted. Just as four steps of how the intumescent paint is applied. Right, now we come to the what is the uh, regulations? You have the testing, certification, and assessments. Testing standards are developed within the fire protection industry worldwide in collaboration with users, manufacturers, and internationally recognized institutes. Who are? There's the American Standard Testing Materials, Underwriters Laboratories, these are both US. There's the British Standard, ISO, which is the international, and recently now we've got ISI, which is the Indian Standards Institute. Testing of fireproofing products are conducted in internationally or nationally recognized laboratories such as the ones that are internationally known is the Ex Exova Warrington in UK for fire tests to the BS British Standard, Underwriters Laboratories UL from the USA for fire tests to the ASTM standards, CBRE Rurki to ISI and British standards, and then there is third party certification which is very important. At the end of the manufacturing, the parties, the actual certificates, the testing certificates have to be third party verified. And the agencies that we know and are internationally recognized are certifier, <coughs> certifier from the US, from the, from the UK, I'm sorry, for, to the British Standard, and underwriters laboratories for fire tests to the UN. There are other international standards, but these are currently popular in India. For cellulosic fire protection, these are the standards which are applicable worldwide. We've got the British, American, Australian, Europe, mainland China, and India. These are the standards. Again, in the standards, the critical steel limiting temperatures where the coatings are tested and the thicknesses are designed to meet these failure temperatures. Under the British, UK, the failure temperatures on sections hollow at uh, columns and hollow is 550 Celsius, whereas in I sections it's slightly higher, it's 620 Celsius. These are the failure temperatures. In the US, UL263, yeah, it's finished. And uh, we've got f uh, a, little, a little more conservative, and the most conservative is Europe, which is the new ENV, which is 500 and 550 Celsius. India is following probably UK and US at the moment. This is for architects to know how to design failure temperatures in their specifications. <coughs> section factors, most people are familiar with section factors. You've got the heated perimeter over the cross-sectional area of the, of the member, and that will be the rate of which a section will heat up in a fire. The higher the value of the section factor, the greater will be the protection thickness. A thinner, a, a lighter section will have a, a higher HPOA factor than a heavier section. So lighter section will need more protection for the same period of time than a heavier section, which is obviously in the heavier section, the rate of heating will be slower. So you need lower protection. So the HPOA is very critical in determining the thickness of the coating for the fire rating period required. These are the National Building Code of India. As we are in India, we have the code part four, fire and safety, classifies and specifies for fire protection in various buildings, factories, warehouses, etc., We can refer to the page NBC code. Here's the code. We've got the types of construction and you've got the floor area ratio. Floor area ratio is the ratios which are shown here for the types of buildings, occupancy classifications. And in that classification, you've got the FAR figures for the type of building, type one, type two, type three, type four. So depending on your FAR, you get the you get the classification and the ratio. Once you've got this, you know the type, which type of building you have. And once you know the type of building, you go to the actual requirement of the, if you go down to number nine, interior bearing walls, bearing partitions, columns, supporting more than one floor. Type one, you need four hour protection. Type two, you need two hours protection. Type three, two hours. Type four, two hours. Separating, supporting one floor, three hours, one and a half, one, one. Supporting a roof only, 
three, one and a half, one, one. Then you come to roof construction, two, one and a half, one, one, more than five meters, but less than 6.5 meters from the lowest potential source of flame level, one, 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 one. And 6.7 meters and above, you don't need any protection. This is the Indian building code, the national building code. It is very clearly defined, which is acceptable to all the fire agencies and everybody in India. So there's no problems with finding out what your fire rating is required for the type of building you have. Unfortunately, there are no mandatory laws to enforce these codes, resulting in gross violation by builders, fire agencies in implementation. And NOC occupancy certifications are given to unsafe buildings. It is our collective responsibility to ensure proper and adequate protection to save lives and properties. Thank you.